Welcome to HIV Hope and Charity, a podcast series brought to you by TVPS, a charity that's been supporting people affected by HIV since 1985. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jess and we work for TVPS and our aim is to get as many people as possible HIV educated. If you like the podcast, please rate, subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Happy New Year! Oh, that was a very cheerful Happy New Year. Like it. Yeah. Welcome to January 2022, Sarah. Wow. It's not like it's just happened. I'm making it sound like we're recording this on the 1st of January. We're definitely not. So far, it's been good, hasn't it? Yeah, no, it has. It has. Well, I mean, you know, COVID's still happening, but that's just life now, isn't it? It is. Yes. We're good at adapting, though. Yes, yes. And I'm hoping things are getting better, you know, fingers crossed. Yes, I say that numerous times a week. It, it, it will get better. This is just a blip. One day, one day, it will, yes. we're two years down the line. One day it will be better. I know, but I always think, I remind myself of when we packed up the office in March 2020 and we knew we'd be working from home for three weeks and we we're like, it won't be long, it'll fly by. Here we are, two years later. It's crazy, isn't it, that that much time's passed. God, I remember that, yeah, packing up. That was quite a... A scary day, really, because it was just so much change, wasn't it? I know, obviously, that was something that was felt like across the nation, but it was really scary time. Yes, a real moment in history that I'll never forget, mainly for my naivety, thinking, oh, this is a lot of hassle for three weeks, but I'll run with it because it will be fine. And then time went on. How long were we in lockdown? 12 weeks? Which one? Which one? The first one. Lockdown 1.0. Why, why do people say 1.0? Surely it's just lockdown one. Yeah, it'd just be one, wouldn't it? Who says lockdown 1.0? Someone on the news was talking about it. They were talking about it in relation to all the parties Boris has attended. And they were li- listing them saying during lockdown 1.0. And I was like, but there's no like 1.1 or 1.2, is there? It's just lockdown one. Maybe, you know, like when they started to ease restrictions and we weren't quite out of lockdown, but we also went in it. Maybe that's like 1.5. I don't know. I just thought it was a weird way to refer to it. That is quite odd. And actually the list that he went through of all the times the rules have been broken was quite long. So I don't know how we referred to this, the second and the third lockdown, because I was just like, oh, there's just too much going on here. But, you know, we're still here. We're still recording our podcast virtually. Staying safe. Yes, we are. And this week, we're paying tribute to uh, the first people in the UK that died of AIDS. Oh, wow. So we're going right back in history this week. And I should point out, actually, that we only have a short amount of time, don't we, for each podcast, because nobody wants to listen to hours of content. I'd happily listen to us chatter all day. We try to keep it snappy. We do. Interesting and snappy. And there are many people that we could have included in this episode. Um, And we, we will come back at a later date to kind of look at this era again because a lot did happen during that time and there are so many more people that we can discover but I've picked two people two of the first people who passed away from AIDS but there are others so this episode really I want it to be a tribute to all of them even though we haven't named them but we're just going to focus on two Okay, well, no, I like that, that we will come back at another date. But like you said, it would be a very long podcast and we want to kind of do everyone justice, don't we? So it's we can't have too many people in one episode. No, because then it just becomes a roll call, doesn't it? But they're all equally important. It's just that these two caught my attention the most and we'll come back and revisit the others. Yeah, they're all amazing. As you know, we say this all the time, don't we? Yes, we do. And they always, everything is amazing, but everyone always is. That's yes. why, that's why we're always saying it. So one of the feature, people we're featuring is a man whose name would later be used to set up the first national HIV charity in the UK. Yes, you're smiling. His name was Terry Higgins. And that charity is the Terence Higgins Trust or THT. You yes. cannot work in our sector without an acronym. It, that's the rules. They're literally yes. the rules. It's like you're setting up a chat. No, it must be an acronym too. They have one, it's THT. Now, he was one of the first people to die of an AIDS-related illness. He was 37 when he passed away. That's so young. I know. And he died on the 4th of July, 1982, at St Thomas's Hospital in London. But he wasn't the first person to pass away. I think in the past it might have been reported that he was, but he wasn't. 
And the reason I know this is that ITV went to extraordinary lengths to identify who that person was. And they did it for a programme called Tonight, Searching for Patient Zero, Britain's AIDS Tragedy. Again, with the patient zero like they did in America. What? Why? Why Why do we always have to have these like terrifying titles? Enough with the patient zero. If you haven't listened, by the way, go back and listen to our very first HIV Heroes episode, which is about patient zero. It's called Reclaim Dugar, but I digress. But just, you know, go and have a listen to that and then you'll know where we're at with the patient zero business. Exactly. Yes. And they've, they've used the same label. So they focus on someone who was called John Eady, and he passed away on the 29th of October 1981 at the Royal Brompton in Chelsea. And the reason they managed to find him is because they managed to identify his cause of death, which was pneumonia. So they traced all the people, all the patients from that year who died at the hospital from pneumonia, and then they found his death certificate. And then they traced his friends through that, the friends that had nursed him in his final days. Probably sounds like ITV were on a bit of a witch hunt, but I do think they had good intentions because they wanted to clear up the mystery around his death and this programme enabled his friends to pay tribute to him. Okay, okay, yes, because it did, I suppose when you were first describing it, that it it sort of did sound like that, especially with the title. So I am pleased to hear that it wasn't a witch hunt and that people did get to spend that time to pay tribute to someone they loved. Absolutely. So I think it's a good thing. Yes, the Patient Zero title is unfortunate, but the programme itself would be a nice way to pay tribute to him and to remember him. So he was well known. He ran a guest house in Bournemouth. And of course, it was very gay friendly and very much described as a safe haven for gay men to just be themselves, which I know sounds bizarre now, but we're in the 80s, very anti-gay period in our history. Yes, yeah, it really is. But I, I I hate to interject, but I have to tell you, right at the start of this podcast, you said to me, we're going right back in history. And I thought you meant like the 1600s. We're in the 80s again, Sarah, just to let you know. It's not it's not that far back in history. Oh, did you get a bit? I was going to announce that I'd unearthed <laughs> HIV in the 16th century. Yes, you were like, so I've been going through the library. <laughs> oh, no. But I'm with you. We've gone right back in terms of HIV history, I suppose. And that is what this podcast is kind of about. So I should have been aware of that. Oh, no, I didn't mean to mislead you. Yes, it's the 80s. It's always the 80s with me. It's a given. If I say we're going back in history, it's the 80s. Without without a doubt. There's no no room for kind of manoeuvre there. If it didn't happen in the 80s just didn't happen it's just not worth happening yeah no, no, that's fair enough no, not interested in any other era I know you know there have been some significant events in history but they weren't in the 80s so why is the 80s your favorite oh think of the fashion we've talked about this pixie boots leg warmers really? t-shirts saying relax you have got an A-team t-shirt I've seen you wear that yes the oh and the Grange Hill one. Oh my goodness by the way I'm so sorry again to butt in but you know that's just what I do deal with it I was watching television over the Christmas period, as you do, and on the news, Sarah, I nearly rang you and thought, don't do that. She doesn't want to hear from me over Christmas because they're making, uh, they're redoing Grange Hill, aren't they? Or they're making a film. They are. They're making a film. The same uh, director that produced Grange Hill. So two things from that. One, never worry about phoning me. Always love to hear from you. And number two, is it a good idea? Grange Hill was iconic in the 80s. I just don't think... I want to revisit it because they're talking, aren't they, about putting a brand new cast, but some references to kind of previous pupils like Zamo. Yes, he was on the interview that I saw. Yeah, he said he would very much be interested in being a part of it. But they were saying, so the the guy interviewing them was saying, basically they're explaining that how um, Grange Hill was able to tackle some very, not I wouldn't say controversial issues, but things that really needed to be addressed at the time that nobody else really wanted to touch, um, especially for young people. And they were saying, do they think they'll still be able to address relevant issues that young people are facing at the moment in the same way that the original Grange Hill did? I'd say, because it was a big part of my childhood. I and mean, you think of TV programmes at the time, You know, the other big program was Blue Peter. Extremely wholesome. I was not a Blue Peter fan. I'm so sorry, everyone that loved Blue Peter. Just was not for me. I I suffered through it till Neighbours came on. (laughs) Me too. But it wasn't, you know, it's just very wholesome television, isn't it? And Grange Hill was gritty and edgy and uh, addressing issues of the time. And it was very relatable. Yeah, no, it'd be great if they could bring it back as a film, but I will not be watching it. It's like when they did the remake, the film of the A-Team. It's not the same. 
It certainly is not the same. I would have to agree with that. Yeah, I think you're right, Sarah. Don't spoil your memories. Just hold on to your Grange Hill memories and let the film be for the new people discovering Grange Hill. Absolutely. A new generation. My children, they can watch it. There we go. Anyway, we've digressed. And a quite early on, well done. <laughs> Nothing changes. Same old. No, no, it doesn't. Right, let's refocus. So we're talking about John um, E.D., the first man in the UK to pass away from HIV. He ran a guest house in Bournemouth and we were just talking about that was a safe haven for gay men. Um, and actually, we were kind of saying that with regards to that time in history, very anti-gay period of time, lots of men couldn't be open about their sexuality. So that guest house must have been like a real tonic for people because they could just be themselves there. And I was thinking kind of right, right while I was pulling this together that actually I do remember personally, one of my friends, she lived a couple of doors down from uh, a gay pub, a very well-known gay pub in our area. And I do remember her mum used to say to us, don't go near that pub. Didn't warn us about any other pubs because everyone, every town's got pubs, haven't they, that are renowned for um, drug dealing, for example. Yes. And this was at a time when there were a lot of illegal raves. Never gave us any warnings about any of that. Just never go in that pub two doors down because men kiss. Bonkers, isn't it? It's like, what do you think will happen? I mean, it was probably the safest pub we could have gone to. (laughs) That's what I was going to say. It's just like, ironically, actually, everyone will be really lovely to you because they're just normal people. Exactly. No one's going to care about us too. No one's going to be interested in us. But no, that was her warning every week. Oh, wow. And did you ever go? No, we didn't. No, when we used to walk past, see, my friend would always say, oh, let's let's cross over the road. And I was just be like, it's fine. <laughs> what? This is madness. I know, I but, know. But that's how it was. That was, And that was the yeah, early 90s. That was a different the time, isn't it? A different time. Very much so. So I hope that people staying in John's guest house, I hope they had the best time ever and fully made use of their little safe haven. That is lovely. And actually kind of very brave, because like you're saying, you, you, you're you just explaining how your friend's mum would be saying, don't go near that pub. You know, I can't imagine what people would have been saying about a guest house like that or or the, the judgment and the hate you might have got for running somewhere like that. So good for him. Exactly. And, you know, when he fell ill, doctors were baffled by his illness. His friends kind of rallied around to care for him, which is lovely. Um, and when he was admitted to hospital, he of course he deteriorated very quickly. And his friends were told that he would die. And that's because at the time, doctors just couldn't do anything to save him. All the usual kind of methods that would work on other people with pneumonia, of course, weren't working on him. And you think, imagine being that doctor or that group of doctors that are faced with something they've never seen before. Somebody comes in, they diagnose them with pneumonia, and then all the treatments you'd usually use just don't work. Nothing's working. It breaks my heart actually a bit, especially even because I weirdly I'm thinking back to It's a Sin and about how Colin was treated in hospital as well. So it kind of just instantly evokes all of that as well. The the isolation on top of the doctors not knowing how to treat you and you not knowing what's happening. And then you're being completely isolated, possibly. Obviously, I don't know if that happened to John. Really heartbreaking. Really heartbreaking. And I think as a medical professional, you're kind of you have the weight of responsibility that you can't make somebody better with um, an illness that normally would be recoverable from. You've also got the disbelief of John's support network, who, again, you know, think, well, pneumonia, you can recover from that, but I've told that he's not going to get any better. Horrible, horrible times to have to be caring for people and with a brand new illness that they know nothing about. Well, it must have been terrifying. Yeah, I know. So that kind of it was a bit of a wake up call for me because I don't think I'd really considered all aspects of this. And as you know, I found it's a sin very harrowing. So I think I just put it to the back of my mind quite a lot of the time. I think that's why this podcast, I know I say that we learn all the time, but we really, really do, don't we? I know that when you're doing research, you're learning new things. And then when you come and tell me, I'm like, what? My head's exploding. Like you're saying, I don't, I, although we've worked within the HIV sector between us for over like 35 years, nearly 40 oh years, God. I know combined bonkers. I didn't know half of the things we learn. So I love doing this, even if no one's listening, even if it's just my mum. Hi, mum. Again. Hi, Paul. Paul's probably <laughs> listening. Hi. Oh, God, are you doing personal shout outs now? This is amazing. To our two listeners. Yes, I am. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. We know lots of people listen. Um, But yeah, so we're just learning along with everyone. I think it's fascinating. It is. in Within this 
program, they, they spoke to a professor called um, Jonathan Weber, and he was doing a study of 400 gay men who were all exhibiting early symptoms of AIDS. So this is around the time of John's death. And he talks about how subsequently 399 of them died. So that gives you an idea of the death rate in those very early days. And he's quoted as saying, you know, we had nothing, nothing for this disease. We didn't even know what it was. Uh, We had no idea until 1984, as we know. But the power of the virus to kill people without intervention was quite extraordinary. So I think that kind of sums up how people working within the NHS must have felt. Yeah. And I think it's easy, isn't it, to forget about them and to focus on the people living with, with HIV and AIDS, but for their medical staff as well. Yeah, the effect it must have had on them emotionally and mentally is devastating. Definitely, yes. Um, now, the other person we mentioned is Terry, Terry Higgins. He was really highly regarded by his friends. Do you know how we know this? Because they named a charity after him. How highly regarded must you be for your friends to do that? That's actually quite true. I was going to say, how do you know that? And it's like, yes, because, yes, because of THT. This is yeah. how we know. That's how awesome he was. Yes. So on THT's website, they very handily have their history, which is good for us if we want to learn more about what happened in the time. So in 1982, after Terry's death, his partner, Rupert Whittaker, and his friends, Martin Butler, Tony Calvert, Len Robinson and Chris Peel met to discuss what could be done around kind of HIV and the situation they were living through. The Terry Higgins Trust was subsequently set up by Martin and Rupert with the intention of preventing others from having to suffer as Terry had. And it focused on raising funds for research and awareness of the illness that back then was called gay related immune deficiency or GRID. So, and we've seen that on It's a Sin. Um, and at the time, the social media posts that you were putting out were giving kind of the, the definitions of, you know, what GRID meant. Thank goodness you did, because I, I mean, I'd never heard of it. It's just yeah. like, why do they keep referring to this? I think that's it. We So we decided to do that, didn't we? So it stood actually up on all of our social media. It's probably easiest to find on our Instagram where there were lots of phrases and terminology being used in It's a Sin that people might not have been aware of. Again, another acronym. As we know, this kind of sector, a sea of acronyms. So we had started posting, just breaking it down and explaining a bit. And yes, GRID was one of the ones that we had explained. Yes. And in those early days, you know, gay related immune deficiency, there's just in itself is targeting gay people isn't it it was very clear from that that this is a gay thing uh, and that people who have it are gay and obviously the name changed later on 1984 thank goodness but back then gosh they must have felt so targeted well yeah it's a complete reflection of the time isn't it you can see and and the perception you know grid exactly and my heart goes out to them as if it's not hard enough to see friends or partners passing away from something that you know very little about you've then got that label attached to all of it So it's really segregating them and and attaching stigma to them right from the very start, which, I mean, gosh, it's harsh, isn't it? We can never, ever forget, can we, how far we've come with treating HIV. We've come less far in terms of stigma, without a doubt. But we just can't ever forget the gay men, and it was mainly gay men in those early days, who lost their lives. That's one thing that doing this podcast has brought home to me. They were whole communities were decimated. They were fighting to be heard, to articulate how their lives were changing. They were becoming activists. They'd they'd not been activists before, but this HIV led them to become activists. It's the only thing that they could do to fight against what was happening, basically. Yeah, to take back some control in some ways of, of, yeah, like you're saying, how their communities were just being devastated by this. Yeah, and Terry Higgins, partner and friends, they're shining examples of that. So through the hurt and the fear, they knew they needed to take action. And I think that highlights how strong the gay community was and hopefully still is, because they were all about looking out for each other and protecting each other. So much like John's guest house is this safe haven where everyone looks out for each other, protects each other. It's, you know, they can meet safely. This is now kind of spreading further in the gay community. They're like, we need to take action. We need to look out for each other. We need to protect each other. We need to stop this from happening. Have the strength to do that when you've just lost your partner or your friend is almost unimaginable. So they set up the Terry Higgins Trust, as we've said, and then the following year, there was a public meeting about GRID, and it's organised by uh, THT and the London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard. A small number of people attended, but from a broad range of backgrounds, and it included somebody called Tony Whitehead, 
who went on to become the first chair of the Trust's steering committee, say, you might not recognise the name, but you'll definitely recognise the face, um, because he's kind of quite well known now. At the time, he was involved in gay activist groups, and he was quite outspoken, actually, about discrimination against sexuality, because that was very common back then as well. He didn't know Terry personally, but during the meeting, he'd been really moved by the accounts that he'd heard from people who'd lost friends and partners, and very moved by Terry's friends and partner, and he just knew he had to do something to help. And because of his background, he was perfect, the perfect man to do the job, to lead the charity forward. So in 1983, the organisation was renamed Terence Higgins Trust. And in January 84, they gained charitable status. And I mean, they've gone from strength to strength, haven't they, since then. But they'll always be known as the first charity in the UK to support those affected by HIV. And actually, they weren't just the first in the UK, they were the first in Europe. Seriously? Mm, I didn't know that. I didn't. They should shout about that more. Well, yes, definitely. The first, yeah, first HIV charity in Europe. Amazing. That's fantastic. And all down to his friends for being so brave and uh, having the strength, like you were saying, not just to be like, right, this happened to us and that's really sad and we're going to kind of hide away and deal with that. But to say, no, actually, no, enough. Like we're going to help others and we, we have to. Oh, well, that's amazing. They are. They're amazing. And we should acknowledge, actually, we should acknowledge them um, in a little bit more detail, because although we're focusing on the first people to pass away from kind of HIV or AIDS, had it not been for this group of, of men, then THT wouldn't kind of exist, really, I guess. So I always kind of look at them. I mean, they are legends, aren't they? Almost like HIV royalty. They're the first ones to take a stance and say, right, we need to start sharing information. Yeah. So one of them is Terry Higgins' partner. We mentioned Rupert Whittaker. He is one of Europe's longest, uh, longest survivors of HIV. So Wikipedia says he was diagnosed in 1981. Really? Yeah. And he's still alive. And I mean, he's amazing. We use yeah. amazing way too much, don't we? I but- know, we need to bring the word jar back. <laughs> yeah, we should have prepared the word jar again. Next time, next time. But yes, um, amazing. I mean, I remember breathtaking was one of the ones, but again, oh. it really fits so well here. But just outstanding, outstanding people. He is outstanding. So he has doctoral qualifications in psychiatry, neurology and immunology and postdoctoral fellowships in immunology, neurological and social psychiatry. He's been an expert advisor to the Department of Health been on numerous committees around medical research and health service delivery. He works in international, well, he's an international forensic expert in psychiatry and public health for the courts. So he's specialising in um, areas of disability, personal injury, clinical negligence, occupational health, but he's doing it across the world. And recently he was awarded an honorary doctorate for his work on HIV, supporting chronic illness and medical mal- malpractice from Royal Holloway University just down the road from us. He's still really within the field. Oh, yes, very much so. And having a really big impact. Um, And he's had health complications along the way because he's lived with HIV for so long. But what a phenomenal person, honestly. Phenomenal. There you go. That's better than amazing. Anyway, if you want to check out more about him, he is very active on Twitter. And there's also, and we'll put the link up for this, there's a short video on the BBC website where he talks about Terry and kind of those early days of HIV, which is very interesting. Yeah, so we'll definitely put the links up. And actually, in terms of THT as well, we'll put their, obviously their website up, but also their social media handles and things. Go and follow them. Go and check them out. Go and learn more about them. Definitely. The other person that we uh, mentioned that start, that set up THT was Martin Butler and he very like Colin in It's a Sin he'd moved to London from Wales to work in the West End and he started to go to clubs like Heaven and Terry Higgins was a DJ at Heaven and kind of took him under his wing a little bit because they're both from Wales so had some common ground and kind of recognised that actually kind of coming out on the gay scene is quite daunting can be quite daunting so I, I imagine amazingly liberating moving from like Wales to London in that time but yes alongside that massively daunting right yeah overwhelming I think because all of a sudden you can completely be yourself Martin talks about in an interview about how you know Terry took him under his wing I was very young I was a little green and he made me feel part of that family talking about that kind of gay family um, and giving him some acceptance and then they say you know it's much deeper than just being friends you are a family you know you choose not to be with your real family 
but you have a family here. So he's painting a picture of kind of what the gay scene could be like, could be very supportive and very kind of caring. Yes. So you can see why he wanted to be involved in setting up a legacy for, for Terry, which is lovely. The other three, so we talked about Len, Chris and Tony, less easy to find out information about them. And I always go along the premise that if it's difficult to find that information, they probably don't want to be in the limelight. So we will respect that. But the most charming thing, I don't think charming is the right word. Whenever you look at talking about the um, THT starting, whether it's on their website um, and they're talking about their history or whether it's on other kind of sources of information like Wikipedia, it's always the same names that are mentioned. Nobody's forgotten. Nobody's above anybody else. They're all remembered together. And I think that shows their strength as a group, doesn't it? As a family. Definitely, yes. And you do wonder, do you think, gosh, at the time, did they envisage that this would lead to other HIV charities popping up around the country? Did they kind of have those dreams or did they just think we've got to help our community in London and we need to do something? God, who knows? And, and who knows what they think about how massive THT have become and the influence they have and the change that they've helped make in the world of HIV, it must blow their minds. I know I'm always saying my mind is blown, but it must blow their minds to be like, we were right there at the start. And actually, we've really done Terry so proud. Absolutely. They've helped his kind of memory live on. And like you say, what they set up will have saved people's lives in terms of, you know, giving people good prevention advice and or supporting people living with HIV to know that, you know, they can do this. And it started from, you know, them sitting down, maybe in a pub somewhere going, we need to we need to do something. Yeah, from such a small beginning of not Terry's death, but of them just meeting up and saying, what can we do? What more can we do to what it's become now? It is amazing. And I think it shows the power of people, really, and what can be achieved. I mean, they're just an amazing group of men. Well, uh, without being like TVPS, but the charity that we work for, Trans Valley Positive Support, That just started in a house in 1985, didn't it? With a group of people in a similar way saying, what should we do? We need some support. Should we, you know, like you're saying, the power of people coming. You're right. And we were fortunate that to have met a couple of the men that started TVPS um, and, and had stayed involved in the charity, you know, when we both started. And they are kind of forces to be reckoned with, aren't they? They've got lots of drive and ambition and passion. That's what comes through, isn't it? Yes, that passion. And I think having lived through such difficult times, losing friends and your family, you know, you're classing your friends as your family, you're losing your family. My goodness, like you're saying, the drive that gives you, the passion that gives you to help others. Absolutely. Oh, I was going to say amazing, but it's phenomenal. And I think, you know, their, their passion, as you grow to understand more about that passion, it kind of reinforces that we have a duty to kind of never forget those early days and to always remember how fortunate the whole sector is that that group of men decided to take action. Yes, unbelievably so. Like you're saying, I think it's really important to celebrate how far we've come, but equally as important to come back and look at who who started everything and where how far we've come, where we came from, what went on. You know, I'm loving learning about it on all these podcasts, I have to say. You know, we know about the vague events. I knew that uh, Terry Higgins was who obviously Terence Higgins just was named after, but I didn't know anything about him or really how how that came to be, the charity. So good job, Sarah. I say it every week. Good job. <laughs> You do. You do. And in future, I want actual rewards. Actual? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't. Well, we're virtual. What could I give you? Uh, Leg warmers, obviously. Post them to you. Oh, my (laughs) God. I'm going to post you 80s attire to wear before our next podcast. (laughs) Headbands? Yes, that's what I want to see. I want want to see you turn up in in actual 80s gear. You keep telling me you love it. I I want to see it now. I I want to see you in those, you know, those enormous sunglasses. (laughs) That you used to get in the eighties, like giant sunglasses. I want to see you in those. Oh. <laughs> I don't remember many people wearing giant sunglasses in the eighties. <laughs> I'm gonna get you some. Timmy Mallet. Oh, I love Timmy Mallet. Seriously, you you didn't love Wackaday. You didn't no. love no. What the wide I was Wake more Club. of a Mallet's Mallet. Huh? Mallet's Mallet. Where's association? Oh, but weren't go? they up against kind of like live and kicking and? No, not at that time they weren't, no. Was it in the 80s? Was it still Swap Shop? No, is, my no. knowledge of Saturday TV is impressive. Wackaday was like, I think it late 80s, 90s. Remember, we're wide awake. Yes, I did. We're, we're ready and we're wide awake. So on your marks and get set, go. 
Well, it had an impact on you. Do you sing that every morning? <laughs> no, and my dog started crying. Like, oh. don't sing ever. <laughs> Why are you singing? Stop it. So, yeah, that's not good. Oh, what a way to end the episode. Are you having well, to comfort your poor dog? Yeah, going to have to go and do that now. Right, see you next time. <laughs> okay, see you later. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to HIV Hope and Charity. If you'd like to know more about the work that we do, visit tvps.org.uk. And please like, subscribe and rate the podcast if you enjoyed it.